And as and they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new what doctrine? See, the problem is it wasn't a new doctrine, was it? It was something that he had taught the the uh, the uh, prophets of old. You know, it wasn't something new. It's because they were did not want to deal with it. And that's why they say, oh, is this something new? And it says, what is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. Yes, when the reason for that is because there was more, other, more people that were possessed with demons, and there was other people that wanted to be freed by that as well. Look at this in Luke. Here is a woman who for 18 years had a physical problem caused by what? A demon. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Here again, on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, Thou art loose from thy infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with an, in, uh, indignation because that Jesus had healed on what? On the Sabbath day and said unto the people, there are six days in which men ought to work. And he's right, six days. But can we not do good on the Sabbath? And then therefore came and uh, and um, and be healed, and not on the Sabbath. The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath lose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day? Today, she would be considered a Christian or a follower of what? Of Jesus and stuff. So he was rebuking them and said, you're all are hypocrites. You do all this other stuff, and then you, 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 know, you profess that you can't do good on the Sabbath. Satan and sin are attached to each other. They are inseparable, and Christians are not immune to sin. Whenever Christians willingly and willfully sin, they put themselves where? On Satan's ground. Under these conditions, he can, and in many cases does, control them to some degree. You don't have to be 100% demonically possessed. It's just enough to get you to do what is wrong. But on the other hand, we have to be 100% possessed by God, don't we? Yes. In the word control seems to be better characterized, uh, characterized demonic possession or oppression. Many debate for hours in an effort to explain the difference between possession and oppression. In the biblical account of those who were vexed, troubled, possessed, or oppressed, there was always a degree of control, a degree, not maybe total. Okay? Peter certainly was not possessed when he told Jesus that he would not have to go to the cross and suffer, but his mouth was definitely controlled for that moment, by who? By Satan, okay? Yet, in this case, which was not demon possession, Jesus rebuked Satan, not who? Not Peter, in this case. So, whatever the case, when it came to demonic activity, it was always hand handled the same way. The devil and his demons were rebuked and commanded to do what? To leave, okay? The bottom line is this. If a Christian is out of control in one or more areas of his life, another power is in control. And according to biblical instruction, it must be rebuked and the power of Satan to be broken. We pray for the, the power of Satan to, to bind the powers of Satan in the name of Jesus Christ. It matters not whether it is possession, oppression, troubled, or vexed. Jesus has given us the the believer in Jesus, the absolute authority in his name over Satan and all the hosts of hell. Because look at this. Another myth or lie which some Christian pastors and writers around the country are con uh, constantly mouthing is the devil and the Holy Spirit cannot be in the same place where at the same time, which is kind of interesting if you think about that. 
Yes, the Holy Spirit doesn't want to abide with you, you know, at the same time Satan is there, but the Holy Spirit is trying to woo you. He's not going to leave. Well, Satan's here. I'm going to leave. And then he, then if he does, then you're in total control of, of Satan. The Holy Spirit is going to be there to try to woo you over. There's a battle. There's a spiritual warfare going on. Christians seem to like this concept because it gives them a false sense of security. Satan and his angels um, uh, revel in this concept because then they can convince the controlled person of his utter hopelessness. See, the Holy Spirit's left. Now we have total control of you. If this idea was true, which it is not, then the drug addict, the alcoholic, the prostitute, and the person in the occult, etc., would not have a what? Chance. This would mean that the Holy Spirit could never work on their hearts to bring them to conviction of sin because Satan and his demons are present. You know? Of course, it can truthfully be said that the Holy Spirit and the hosts of hell certainly do not work in harmony with each other. They don't work in concert, do they? However, the Holy Spirit would have to be there even while the spirits of evil are also present in carrying on their work in order to work on the heart and the mind of the fallen person to bring him to where? To conviction and all that. That's what Romans 2 verse 4 is. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. So it's the goodness of God. God is there trying to woo us. Satan is there trying to you know, pull us or whatever into doing what's wrong, into sinning. To simplify this, let us use a basic example of a, a pitch dark room with no light in it, representing the mind of the lost person. If a match is lit in one corner of the room, 99% of the room is still in total darkness. Then if a lamp is turned on, given more light, there is still much darkness. So we continue lighting more lamps till enough light is emitted and eventually all the darkness is gone. But until enough light is brought into the room to banish our darkness, both darkness and light exist well, how? at the same time and in that same room. This is the way it is when the Holy Spirit begins to work in the mind of a lost person. The more truth that is being allowed to be in there, the more light, the more victories, the more that they become like Christ, don't they? Today, the devil knows that, th that his time is short and he is going about like a roaring lion seeking whom he, may, whom, he may, whom he may devour. The problem is that we as Christians do not recognize this and so we go about with the attitude that the battle we are fighting is how? With each other. We look at each other. We look at each other with dis dis disdain, disdain and all that, not knowing that you know there's an internal warfare, there's an internal struggle for us and let's not take it out on each other just because things are, are going bad, uh, going wrong. Ephesians 6.12 says, uh, uh, clearly tells us that we are not in a battle with each other, but with vicious spiritual powers that are intensely focused on destroying every person and family who are striving to follow Jesus. In subsequent verses of this chapter in Ephesians, there, are, there is evidence of this terrible battle and instruction is given as to how to put on the armor of God in order to be protected from these raging demonic forces. That's why every day we have to armor up, put, wherefore put on the full armor of God. And that's why we're looking at recognizing demonic influence in your home and in your daily life. This is something we have to clearly understand and, and, and recognize and work toward. So in Ephesians 6, 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against what? Spiritual weakness is where? In high places. Look what spiritual gifts tells us. Deceived mortals are worshiping evil angels. Can you imagine that? Wow. Believing them to be the spirits of their dead friends. She says, I have been shown. Remember when I say, uh, I told you, when she says, I've been shown. I saw, I was told, we better pay attention. So she says, I was, I have been shown that Satan transformed into an angel of light works with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. He who could take up the Son of God, who was made a little lower than the angels and place him upon a pinnacle of the temple and take him up into an exceeding high mountain to present before him the kingdoms of the world can, look what he, 
can exercise his power upon the human family who are far inferior in strength and wisdom to the Son of God even after he had taken upon himself man's nature. In this degenerate age, Satan holds control over mortals who depart from the right and venture upon his ground. He exercises his power upon such in an alarming manner. I was directed to these words, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Some, she says, I was shown, gratify their curiosity and tamper with the devil. Oh, I'm just wonder how far I can get. They have no real faith in spiritualism and would start back with horror at the idea of being a what? See, here's the thing. Many people don't think that, you know, oh, well, I can't be a medium. You know that, uh, that, uh, that Eve was a medium for Satan to go and deceive Adam. Adam knew who that was. So she became a medium or demonically possessed. Yet they venture and place themselves in a position where Satan can exercise his power upon them. They do not mean to enter deep into his work, but such know not what they are doing. They are venturing upon whose? The devil's ground and are tempting him to control them. This powerful destroyer considers such his lawful prey and will exercise his power upon them and that against their will. When they wish to control themselves, they cannot. So Satan's not going to let, let it go, uh, let, lose, lose control of them. They yield their mind to Satan, and he holds them captive, and he will not release his claims. No power can deliver the ensnared soul but who? The power of God. In answer, look, in answer to the earnest prayers of his faithful followers. So guess what? It behooves us. The responsibility lays with us that if those that are possessed, we must pray earnestly. It is left to, left to us to pray earnestly for these individuals. Ephesians 6.12 clearly tells us that we are not in a battle with each other, but with vicious spiritual powers that are intensely focused on destroying every person and family who are striving to follow Jesus. In subsequent verses of this chapter in Ephesians, there is evidence of this terrible battle and instruction is given as to how to put on the armor of God in order to be protected from these raging demonic forces. And so, so many parents cannot understand why their families are falling apart, why their children are rebelling, why their marriages are ending in divorce and chaos is taking over. Young children and teens are at a loss to understand why their Christian parents cannot get along and are divorcing. Do you not see that? Yes, they, they're trying to figure out what is going on. Christian leaders also are scratching their heads in disbelief because the divorce rate among Christians equals to that of the world. Hate, anger, and violence have become so prevalent that news magazines print feature articles specifically on these, to uh, these topics, and they, even, they bring in about the Christians that their, their divorce rate is the same as those that, that don't profess any type of religion. It is essential for us to understand that Satan is on the loose and is on a rampage against us. We continue to avoid and ignore him at the peril of our eternal salvation. It is essentially because of this willful ignorance and blindness that Satan has so much influence and control in the lives of who? Of Christians. Look at what 1 Peter 5.8 says. Be sober. Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may what? Devour. He's going around there. He's wanting to see who he can take out. Look at this quote that I found. Mark Ubik, a pastor and Christian writer, said, For a believer to keep himself in the dark about Satan's person and work is a dangerous mistake. He said, if this enemy with whom we as personally have so much to do in battle remains to us some mysterious, foreboding, awesome power we are afraid to oppose, we are indeed in, in or at a disadvantage. If we're scared of him, we shouldn't be scared of him. And I'm not saying going, and I know there's some people that are, you know, they're going around and, uh, you know, trying to um, uh, 
cast out demons and stuff. That's not something that we should go and, you know, uh, uh, initially to go uh, and try to do. It is something that you may come across, but you need, you're going to be prepared for that because there's going to be people that in your life that may be demonically possessed, and then God may call upon you to pray for them earnestly and all that. So the other thing he said is, from a biblical perspective, we should know all we can about Satan's tactics and his methods of attack against us. We must also know the biblical basis of our victory over Satan and his world of darkness. So we need to understand the enemy. Before you go into battle, you know, don't we, aren't we supposed to know the, the strengths and, and weaknesses of our enemy? His tactics and stuff? Yeah, the Bible tells us the Satan's uh, weaknesses and, and his tactics and his strengths and all that. Now let us consider some of the devil's footprints in our lives. This is direct warfare, and we must take it seriously, correct? Strife in the home. Strife between husbands and wives, between parents and, and children, is where Satan is going to do his best. Rebellion. Teenagers rebelling against parental authority in the home. Lack of spiritual interest, and in some cases, even mocking Christian principles. That is dangerous. It, remember the, the young... Um, Israeli children that were mocking Elisha, go up thou bald head. What happened to them? They came out and they were torn, torn apart. Absence of home discipline. Our homes need to be have discipline. They have rules and orders and all that. Or if you have guests in your home, they need to respect your rules and, and all that to abide by them. If there is no sound biblical discipline in the home, the devil and his evil spirits will rule. You can, you can count on it. That's why, brothers and sisters, in the times that we're living, financial and everything else, our, our, our uh, brothers and sisters may be living together to try to help share the burden of expense and everything else. Well, if you're moving into somebody's home, you need to respect that person. You need to you know, uh, uh, understand what their, their wishes are, and the same goes back both ways as well. The other thing is anger, sudden, unprovoked anger in men and women, display of temper, tantrums and angry outbursts in little children or even older. Don't older uh, people have temper tantrums? They never grew, grew out of it, right? Look at this. Wrong kinds of activities and items in the home. Wrong types of music. Satanic games such as the Ouija board, evil TV programs, wicked videos, movies, games, drug involvement, gross and ugly toys that portray evil as being acceptable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If we're planning to go to heaven, we must clean up our home, don't we? We must get things rid of that that's in our house as well. Look at this. Personal appearance. You know, faddish uh, observed hair colors, okay, um, and styles. Clothing designed to make a person who was created in God's image look ugly and ridiculous or the opposite of what sex you originally was, immodest appearing. There's some out there that they're not happy being a woman. They want to be a man, vice versa. So they go through this whole thing. It's not what God intended. You know, accept it. Be happy with it. God, God created all beautiful, regardless of what sex you are. The other thing is bitterness and resentful feelings against a spouse, child, or parent, against someone in the church or community. Deep depression and feelings of suicide as well. Satan's doing whatever he can. This is so prevalent in the lives of many young people today, feeling a hopelessness during this whole pandemic. How many suicides have, ha have happened? Increase in suicide exponentially and all that. The over-the-counter depression you know, medications and stuff ha has just flown, almost flown off the shelves. People are so much depressed because, you know, increase, I mean, this is kind of a good thing, increase of homeschooling 700% this past year. You know, and a lot of them are liking it, you know, and it's probably, that's the best thing really to me is, is homeschooling. Infidelity between husband and wives. Today, the devil is uh, whipping up the passions, tempting men and women to be unfaithful to their spouses. Excuse me. Getting a drink of water. Physical tax. Job 2.7 is an example of how the devil can afflict physically. In Matthew 12.22, we read of a man who was demonically blind and dumb. In Mark 9.17.22, there is the account of the, the boy who had a demonic problem of seizures. Remember? 
And look at this. Please understand that I do not believe that every sickness or illness is demonic. I do believe that people given into the temptations of the devil to get them to indulge in appetites and passions, which in turn, look, brings on many physical problems. So we, if we you know, give into indulgence, that leads into other temptations and stuff that the devil can use. So look, physical and verbal abuse, loud, bad language, and physical attacks against a family member, Satan's going to do. Uh, a person trying to intimidate or bully, and this can happen in the church, intimidation and bullying within members and stuff. That shouldn't happen. That's uh, one thing a couple of Sabbaths ago I, sh- I was sharing the list of problems that we have, and one of them is called uh, uh, FPP, Friendship Protection Program. We become good friends with you know someone in the church, and then they do something, and then we put ourselves in position, well, I, I don't want to get involved because they don't want to lose the, the, the friendship, plus they don't want to uh, be opposed to the church, so they want to take a neutral stance. Well, a neutral stance, you've already taken a position, haven't you? You know, we have to take a stand for right because it's right against wrong because it's wrong, regardless of where, where it may lie. The other thing is uh, premarital sexual activity. Even a young, among young and older teenagers, the devil wants to destroy and pervert one of the most beautiful things God has given to a what? Married couple. They just belittle it. They, they water it down so it be, doesn't become precious and all that. The other thing is fear and panic attacks. Panic attacks are becoming a plague these days. There must be a thousand kinds of fear through which the devil keeps Christians in bondage. One of his most effective tools is to keep people in fear of him. In this way, he keeps them from rebuking him in the name of Jesus Christ as well. And the other thing is lust, engaging in various forms of fantasy, self-abuse, or pornography, Anything, again, to distract our mind, anything to keep us from Jesus Christ, he wants to do. So, guess what? It only takes two, doesn't it? It takes one. It only takes one. It is very interesting that often it takes only one, only, it takes only person in a home to allow Satan to influence him to break down the family unit. To save our homes, we must recognize and discern this satanic influence to become warriors in the army of Jesus. That's why, you know, Abraham Lincoln said, a, a house divided against itself cannot stand. He was quoting the Bible, was he not? In this first section, I have briefly outlined the reality of the battle thus far and how to recognize demonic influences in your home and in your life. God will help you recognize other areas in which the devil may be influencing your home, correct? That's why it can take one, the change of me, me making changes to help other people, each one reach one, each one win one, each one, you know, bring them to Christ and all. Jesus Christ has given the answers in his holy word. The answers cannot be found anywhere else. Some of you may be caught up in the captivating therapies of psychology and so-called biblical counseling. If so, it is our hope that you will soon see how Jesus is the only one who can deal with demonic powers and the sin problem. Psychology is not the answer to your problem, because if you understand where psychology came from, Sigmund and Freud, demonic you know, uh, influence, it hasn't changed. It's just been given Christian jargon and stuff. There's nothing Christian by psychology. Sin and demons do not eg- uh, eg- exit in the thinking of psychological world. Intellectual books written by so-called Christian psychologists and so-called biblical counselors have taken the place of the Bible truth. Christ took our sins upon himself, and only he has victoriously overcome Satan. Sin and death, so we may also have the same victory. It is time we look into who? Jesus only for the answers. And so, dear friends, please take heart. There is hope for you in whatever situation you may find yourself. It is our prayer that as you continue through this study, that you will find answers that will set you free and free in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Got a few more minutes and we will stop for part one. Here are, here, I'm sorry, are you opening the door to the devil? 
a special emphasis on forgiveness. This is one thing that I've been seeing we're having problems with in Adventism is the, the word forgiveness. One of the greatest deceptions of the devil is the disaster result of not forgiven. Forgiven. It is often referred to as holding a grudge. Most people do not realize it, but each day brings situations that could cause the spirit of unforgiveness to take hold in their lives. This is a grievous sin, and if it is not dealt with, it could cause one to lose his salvation. It destroys like how? A deadly cancer. Let us look at what Jesus had to say about it in Matthew 18. When Peter asked him, how often? Shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till how long? Seven. Till seven times, actually seven, 70 times seven. The Pharisees limited forgiveness to three times. Peter sought to extend it to seven. That's why it stopped at seven. He thought, okay, well, hold on. Maybe I could be a little bit more gracious, more of a Christian. I'll add four more. But Jesus taught that we should never become weary of forgiven, not until when? Seven times, he said, but until 70 times seven. So we're going to keep track? No, we shouldn't. I know that some people do keep a track. Um, you have you know, the, the scoreboard of how many times I've forgiven them. And all. But the point Jesus was trying to make was we will forget, won't we? We will forget. And so in Matthew 18, 23 to 34, I encourage you to read that. I'm not going to go through through uh, this right now with you, but I encourage you to read here. Um, in the parable Jesus spoke to Peter, there are several points that really stand out. One, the king who forgave represents who? Christ. The debt the king Jesus forgave was immense compared to the debt the servant was required to forgive. The whole immense debt was forgiven. The servant soon had the opportunity to follow the example of the king in forgiving his servant a very small debt. So those who are forgiven much, we must love much, correct? And also that love is part, you know, um, part of forgiveness as well. So if someone for, uh, owes us a debt, we should forgive them because God forgave us, correct? All right. When the king's servant refused to forgive his, his servant... The pardon that was given him by the king was revoked. It was canceled because he would not also forgive. So when God forgives us, we don't realize this. God can't forgive us if we're not able to forgive others. That forgiveness is canceled because it can't forgive other people. The king could not forgive if the servant didn't forgive as well. Matthew 18, 34 says, and his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors, or jailers, till he should pay all that was due unto him, mean the king. That's a huge debt, wasn't it? So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. So the forgiveness that we've had for whatever sins, small, big, or whatever, large, if we are not forgiven, the debt comes back to us back on top of this, and that's a debt that I don't want to pay. How about you? So I want, to, I want to know how to forgive everyone else. First, let us examine the meaning of the word forgiveness. Vine's Bible Dictionary says to send away, forgive a debt, completely cancel, remission of, a remission of punishment due, to bestow a favor unconditionally, to let loose, what? Release, let it go. Webster Dictionary gives this meaning to excuse a fault, pardon, to absolve from what? From payment, meaning there's no payment to do here. Mark 11, 25 tells us, gives us a very good de uh, definition of what forgiveness means. And when ye stand praying, forgive, if ye have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your own trespasses. In other words, Drop it. If you go to him and we have not forgiven one another, we can't be forgiven. But if we have forgiven, then we're able to be forgiven and because we have dropped it. That's why to forgive or to not forgive is a question that is um, on many minds that is, you know, 
afflicting many within our church and even outside the church as well. Now, let us consider seven reasons why forgiveness is so important. I've got a couple of minutes and then we'll stop. Forgiveness, number one, is obedience to God. He says to forgive. In Ephesians 4.32 says, And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, what? Forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath, hath done what? Forgiving you. Number two, forgiveness allows faith to work. In Mark 11, Jesus spoke about forgiveness in connection with having the faith to move what? A mountain. In Genesis, we read of Joseph's unwavering faith that God honored so many times. If he hadn't been so willing to forgive his brothers for what they had done to him, his faith wouldn't have worked. Unforgiveness destroys your faith. They cannot work together. Unforgiveness and faith, they, they are not co-workers. They're antagonists to each other. And Mark 11 says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he has he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore, I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, what are we supposed to do? Believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. And when ye stand praying, forgive, if ye have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. How many of us want our sins to be forgiven. Amen. Amen. Look at number three. It also rids us of spiritual filthiness or unforgiveness is spiritual filthiness, isn't it? Proverbs 18, 14 says, the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear? Avoids weights like dirt, unforgiveness on your spirit. We must be washed clean in the blood or the word in the inner man. It has to be the inner man that has to be washed and clean. Number four, forgiveness removes the tortures of what? Of the soul. Unforgiveness brings on depression, lack of joy, heaviness of spirit, unhappiness, the feeling that something just isn't right. Unforgiveness poisons the soul. It is a slow death, both physically and spiritually. To forgive removes all these things and brings peace. So brothers and sisters, I, I pray that this can be a blessing, that this can be a help to you. We're going to stop for a minute here for part one, and then uh, um, we'll continue on uh, with part two here in a minute. So if I, if I encourage you, if you can, if you're with me in prayer as we um, uh, conclude here. Thank you for coming. Father in heaven, we thank you again that you have given us the power, you have given us the peace, you have given us the ability to have victory in Jesus Christ. We do want to be free from Satan and his bondage, that we, there will be nothing that can be laid against God's people. And so we ask, Father, for that cleansing stream, that forgiveness, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.